Um, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to Meet the US Commissioners panel. Thank you very much for coming. Forgive my voice. It is the last <laughs> day. We've all been having a good time. Hopefully it lasts yeah. out. Um, I'm Natal Snack, president of Snack & Co. And like these guys, I've uh, flown in from LA uh, uh, to escape the madness of Trump land briefly um, for the peace and harmony that is Brexit Britain. Um, uh, one of the reasons for this panel, one of the reasons I'm excited about Edinburgh this year is that there are so many American buyers this year there, there didn't used to be, and there used to be the odd face here. And uh, I've been telling people for a long time that they need to come here because it's exciting and people talk about ideas and hopefully you just haven't been endlessly pitched. But hopefully you guys today will, will learn the, the, the best way to pitch uh, and sell shows to these guys. Uh, I'm going to introduce them, and, and in the first half of the panel, I want them to just tell us all about their particular channels and, the, you know, what are their best shows, and then uh, let's get into the nitty gritty of how we do um, and how you do, you guys do get to these people and, and get to sell shows and the kind of deals and things that we can make. Um, so first up, Gina McCarthy is Executive Vice President for Programming at Lifetime Unscripted. Key shows are Married at First Sight and Bride and uh, Prejudice, lots of us, I'm sh others, I'm sure you will tell us. We're going to see a little film of everyone's uh, shows in a minute. <laughs> Fun fact about Gina, she's a keen swimmer. So, um, and they do a lot of wedding shows. So send all your one underwater wedding formats to <laughs> Gina. Guaranteed commission. Um, Mike Stiller, uh, uh, Vice President of Development and Programming at the History Channel, uh, part of the A&E group, uh, as, as along with uh, Lifetime. Some of Mike's biggest shows are Forged in Fire and Curse of Oak Island. Again, we'll see some of them on the tape. Favourite British show is Peaky Blinders, I'm told. Also, is a secret fan of We Bear Bears, which is about a trio of naked bears who explore San Francisco in search of a good time. You my, might have my to daughter explain watch, I, clarify, that. My daughter watches, I something my daughter watches, <laughs> but I like to watch it. You know, like over her shoulder, I'm not ashamed to say I, Sounds I, I good. enjoy it. Sounds good, but strange. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Rachel Brill is Senior Vice President of Unscripted at Epics and in her spare time has climbed no fewer than 18 major mountains around the world. Very impressive. Uh, Epics have recently moved heavily into Unscripted that were, um, you know, I, along with everybody else, I think is keen to hear about and uh, just relaunch the Mark Burnett format. The contender again, we'll see on the tape. And then we have Charchi Senior, uh, Senior Vice President of Alternative Series and Development at Paramount. I hear Charchi is a big Benny Hill fan. <laughs> hey. um, and like so Rachel, a keen climber, you just uh, scaled Machu Picchu recently, didn't you? That's the only. Oh, I, the only. I'm nothing you have like to start her. somewhere. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it was terrifying. Uh, I was going to say, so if you want to avoid TV people, obviously don't take up mountaineering and stick to <laughs> elevators. Um, uh, so let's have a quick look at some of these guys' key shows um, and then uh, learn more from them about their channels. Can, can we play the tape, please? Four couples have put their marriages on the line. You're going to participate in switch therapy. For two weeks and put us with a different spouse. In order to save them. What the hell? We've officially lost our minds. Don't worry about it. We're going to be okay. We want to get back to the love we used to have. Everything is at stake right now. Live or die, sink or swim. Based on what you've experienced, are you going to part ways for good? Or do you want to stay together forever? This all yourself. Each one of us is going to team up with one of you. This is the toughest course ever devised. 
this is for 10 grand. You're 10 years old and you're in this terrible circumstance. Hitler invalidated our passports. Events that changed the world. How did you first see Gary Ferguson? Crazy American cowboy. <laughs> People who changed each other's lives. There's nobody that had a bigger impact on my life. Mary Frances was standing up for you. I need to see her and it gets more urgent the older I get. Rika, look at you. It's been a lifetime, hasn't a it? Time. We'll meet again only on PBS. For this competition, you'll be competing in teams. Your coaches are two of the most versatile artists this competition has ever seen. Unfortunately, they both left just shy of the win, sparking one of the biggest rivalries in Ink Master history. And now, they're back to settle the score. Kristen Buckingham and Clean Rock One. Ink Master, grudge match, Clean versus Kristen. Um, so, uh, let's talk about your channels first. Um, one of the first things that struck me when I moved over to America and started pitching there is how for, uh, forensic the channels were in knowing and understanding their audience. Um, tell us about Lifetime and your audience. Yes, so Lifetime is, is a wonderful brand. We are a female network. Um, our core demo is women 25 to 54. Uh, we're part of the A&E network um, family and with history and A&E channel. Um, we do a, a lot of scripted movie output, limited scripted series, and this is my second tenure at Lifetime. Lifetime. I joined eight years ago to really rev up the unscripted output. So I developed shows for a second city, middle American demographic. You know, we're not a coastal brand like Bravo. We're not a youth brand like MTV. We're right in the middle and we're always looking for amazing characters, amazing formats that reinvent classic genres, particularly relationship genres right now for this female demographic. Um, right now, we have tremendous. I'm just going to keep going with what. No, we're no. Tell for. us, tell us your, yeah. your best shows right now. So, um, in my first tenure, I developed Dance Moms, Bring It, Preacher's Daughters, big character, big talent wheelhouse um, with these outrageously, we call them outrageously relatable heroines, anchoring it. Um, we always are looking for worlds that have this inherent prurient interest for the female demographic. And when we get it right, uh, Dance Moms is set in Pittsburgh, that happens to be my hometown. I know, I know those characters, but it's very unique in the competitive landscape. So when we strike, when we find the right world and the right characters, it can be lightning in a bottle. So we're on the prowl for more of those. Um, the relationship genre is something uh, that we, you know, I'm proud that we reinvented it at FYI, which is also within the A&E network portfolio. Married at First Sight was our premier um, series swing, and we brought it over to Lifetime because it was so big, it needed a bigger platform. That's now beachfront property uh, in a way for us to reinvent relationship genres under the banner of provocative concept, credible treatment. Um, that led to other shows that I've brought with me from FYI, which are already working. So Seven Year Switch, Bride and Prejudice, um, and we're using that to populate and search for formats from around the world. Um, one of them, Married, is a Danish format. The others are, are things that we've created ourselves with production partners and then exported to the rest of the world. Um, so those are the two main strands that we're looking for right now. So you're sort of middle America, middle-aged mums. That's how I think of it. Is that too basic? <laughs> we are, you know, the best shows can pull in everybody. Yeah. I always say second city because it's not, you know, middle America, you think of... What, does, what, what, what do you mean it, by second? Pittsburgh, it's, Atlanta, so it's not, we're Chicago. Not coastal. We're yeah, not, it's yeah. not a coastal brand. You know, yeah. you can't out-bravo-bravo, bravo, you know, who does 
a certain kind of voice, yeah. um, a more elitist point of view than what we do at Lifetime. Um, but when we're very disciplined in, in, in understanding who that demographic is, then there's a world of characters and formats that, that we're using to transform Lifetime. But I mean, uh, obviously you're, you're talking about the second cities, but formats have traditionally always been very important to Lifetime, haven't and, they? And they continue to Which be important. Where, yeah. yeah, I mean, Married at First Sight is a format, Seven Year Switch is a format, Bride and Prejudice is a format. We have this burgeoning pipeline with a lot of formats that we've created ourselves. But I, you know, in, in my history, we d I have done a lot of work with, with UK producers and I see several familiar faces right now. Um, but we're all always looking for, you know, what is the next super nanny? What is the next wife swap? Um, what are self-contained formats that we can start to populate the schedule with? I almost have to reverse engineer um, doing self-contained formats because right now, for female networks, it's the serialized arced doc soaps or competition formats or social experiments that are breaking through in prime time. And then if I can incubate self-contained formats like a new version of Wife Swap off the back of those, then we can start having these lovely repeatable formats. Brilliant. Mike, uh, again, when I first got to history, uh, to, to the US, and we were making a show for history, it wasn't new, and again, the, the forensic nature of the casting, I was told in no uncertain terms that I was only to cast white bearded blokes and no women. And if I was ever quoted on it, it would be denied. But it was, actually it was quite easy because it was like, it was like, okay, I know how to cast this. That's not that complicated. Yeah. Is, is that still well, the I, case? I'm glad you pointed out that I did not give you that. You did not say that and I won't name who it is. Right. But. You know, and honestly, it's, um, it's important to be, you know, I would say there was probably in a moment in American cable um, and not by design, but strictly because following what was working after Swamp People came out where you saw a lot of that character type yeah. and there's nothing wrong with that character type. But obviously history like every network is looking for different types of faces now and trying to broaden out, you know, who is on TV. A fun fact about history, it's, um, it was a network that spun off of A&E in the 90s. When I was a kid, history ran, or A&E ran history documentaries. Mm -hmm. And they sort of identified that as, as an important part of themselves. They formed the History Channel. We're a top network on our own right now. Um, I would say that uh, <coughs> much of what we do, I would call nonfiction entertainment. Um, I didn't develop Forged in Fire, but that's a, a, a very successful show for History Channel. Um, we do a lot of, um, and had Sorry, a lot Forged of, in Fire, and it's a competition show. It's a competition, it's a competition show, show, and we've had some success lately with what I would call skilled competition. So it's not necessarily fish out of water competition. Mm -hmm. How's this person gonna do forging a sword that's never forged one? They're expert, uh, you know, uh, blacksmiths, but obviously in a very kind of elevated way. You know, it's, it's very much for entertainment, but with history infused through it. Uh, we do Curse of Oak Island, which is a show I did develop. It's our, our biggest hit, um, and it's a, it's a treasure hunt about two brothers. One is a, a millionaire, the other was a, a postman who had never left home, and they have this very real connection to an island. Um, off of Canada where there may or may not be a, a massive treasure. And it's just a, it's a wonderful show told by a great storyteller. The producer is fantastic. And uh, just an onion you want to keep peeling. And we do scripted shows. We do Nightfall. We do um, Vikings, obviously. We're going to do Project Blue Book very soon and are feeling pretty good about that. And a last piece of, of kind of who we are is those premium documentaries. <laughs> So we've always done those, we love those. Um, typically not two hour specials, we do some of that, not a lot of that, but we do um, more limited series. Mm -hmm. We just announced that we had uh, um, licensed the new Ron Chernow book on Grant and we're gonna do a Grant mini series that gets us into pre-Civil War. And, and how, uh, how many of your uh, shows were, are with British producers now, would you say, or are they all American? It's funny, I was, we, were, we were discussing this on the phone a little bit. Um, a decent amount of the premium documentary is. I mean, there's just tremendous talent here um, in that world. Um, Jane Root, 
uh, of Newtopia has done some of our best stuff there, America's Story of Us. Um, oh, well, I'm, <laughs> my, all right. Nasty's coming through. <laughs> okay, there we go. well now we get that. <laughs> well, luckily I'm loud. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we do a lot of work with Raw, so quite a bit in premium, and you know, a, a growing, I'd say a growing amount in more formatted stuff. I've had some great meetings this week, and there's some real opportunities there. Arrow, we've done a lot of work with in premium. Brilliant. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to how new people can, can get to you. Um, Rachel. Yes. Um, Epics. Um, I've only recently started doing the unscripted. Is that right? So, so tell us yes. about that, because I'm as interested as everyone else about <laughs> Well, I'll tell you about the yeah. genesis of Epics. So we are a premium subscription network, and we are new in the original programming to the extent that we're making a really big push in originals. And we're scripted, we're unscripted, and we are feature docs. And um, MGM bought us out fully last September from our partners, which were Viacom and Lionsgate. And when that happened, we tr tr transitioned into this original programming um, output. And I was brought in about six months ago to head up uh, building out the unscripted division. And what we are focusing on, because we are sort of middle-aged, we're affluent, we're intelligent, we are coastal, <laughs> unlike, unlike Lifetime, um, very much coastal, but we are not elitist. And I think that that's a big distinction for us, is that we want intelligent, provocative programming, um, in the, primarily in the doc series space, but we are not elitist. So we want approachable characters. We want relatable themes. We want um, to connect. We want to feel. And we want to go what I would call six feet under. So if reality formats are traditionally, you lay your foundation, you build from the ground up, we want to sort of take the nuance of what works so well and non-scripted, but we want to go six feet under. We want to take documentary storytelling and we want to go back. We want to see from where these characters came. We want to understand their motivations and that is going to bring um, what we feel is, is an epic series. Our first to launch is um, The Contender, which premieres today, and that is a legacy Mark Burnett format from MGM. And what we did there, and I think this is a really important message That's for the, the community. Just to remind people, it's the boxing competition. It's a, bo it's a boxing competition. And the original format started on NBC. It then went to ESPN and Versus for a couple of years, but it was a traditionally structured reality competition. And what we did is we said, if here's your format and all of the strings of your marionette are the format layers, your tentpole events within a traditional reality competition, we want to lift those strings and say there is no format. It's really just a character doc series and it's a profile. Is there a competition? Yes. It's 16 boxers fighting for $250,000. At the end, somebody's going to win. But boxing is a very simple premise. It's a premium sport that has worked on HBO and Showtime. We think it's going to work on Epics. But really, it's a character drama. At every episode, there is a fight. Somebody loses, somebody goes home. And no host, it's, it's not host driven. There's, we don't have a traditional host. We have um, Andre Ward, who is a uh, world champion, gold medal Olympian, and he is more of a mentor. So he has retired, but this is the first time he actually gets back in the ring with these guys because he wants to have that one-on-one -on -one time with them to really understand and coach and motivate them and make them become better men. So he's helping them in the ring and out. And that's why we don't want to refer to him as a host, but the traditional model would say, yes, he's a host, but yeah. we really like to call him a mentor. I'm going to go back for a minute to this um, th this description of coastal Second City, Middle America. Uh-oh. <laughs> and explain what does it mean. It means, uh, my understanding, the coast coastal is more sophisticated, Middle America, less sophisticated, bit Trump land. Is that what we're talking about? I, I, wouldn't, be, like, I wouldn't be so binary <laughs> I in that no, description. I'm, I'm but... probably, no, I think that's I'm, very simplistic. I'm being yeah. deliberately simplistic. Yes. I, explain, explain it to us a little bit more then. The, so. way, the way we describe coastal is, is obviously the East Coast, West Coast, New York, LA sensibilities. And what I will say to that is British sensibilities align with the Epic's audience. We're a little bit more witty in an intelligent, sophisticated, provocative manner which is why we thought it was so important to come to Edinburgh, 
because of these sensibilities. The British, like every single pitch that comes in to me, it's the raw, it's the pulse, it's the films of record and zinc and Roy sitting over there. That it's, it's those, the intelligent sensibilities without being a little bit too elitist and a little bit too, you know, nose turned up yeah. that, that we're looking for. And, and it is, we're tackling doc series as opposed to formats because we want compelling characters. They will be limited um, series and, and one-offs. Um, contender is an anomaly, but in addition to that, we're building what will become our late night slate and more of our formats will fall into that category. So comedy, um, if you hearken back to the days of HBO and how they broke the mold with real sex and taxi cab confessions, we want some of those prov provocative formats in our, in our late night past 11.30 p.m. Can the rest of us address that? Yeah, also? my, oh, my yeah. deeply simplistic description of America. <laughs> Please correct so, it. So <laughs> it's, it's more a voice and a sensibility rather yeah. than, you know, I, I, I don't view it as political mm. at all. It's that voice, it's that sensibility. Um, that we use a ter it's re for lifetime, we use a term outrageously relatable because it, you know, our audience is looking for people that look and sound like them. It's more of a middle middle income, but aspiring to hire. Yeah. It has to be an outrage, a large, if I'm on TV, I'm not the, you know, yeah. the, who's gonna watch that? But you put Abby Lee Miller, someone that yeah. just embodies to the 100th degree, yeah. that value system, and it's explosively good. Um, co you know, but it, with the with the carrot of, of aspiring to a higher lifestyle right. and married at first sight, these are real people. They're not actors. They're not Ken and Barbie, literal scripted actors that you see on, on other sh yeah. wonderful shows yeah. like The Bachelor. Um, they're not the Real Housewives, and that's an amazing, brilliant franchise. But it's but it's a it's different glamorous. tone of voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a different world and sensibility. Okay. Um, Chachi, tell yeah. us about Paramount recently relaunched. We re so Paramount rebranded or became Paramount from Spike. So Spike rebranded as Paramount. Um, and the, the, you know, first and foremost, Spike was a male facing brand. Um, it, I got to Spike two, year, two and a half years ago. And one of my jobs was to try and bring in a more female audience, even prior to us knowing we were transitioning to Paramount. Um, so we have shows on Spike like um, Ink Master and Bar Rescue and Lip Sync Battle. These are the, with the traditional sort of unscripted shows. Uh, Ink Master, when I got there, was 55% male. Um, by the time we transitioned to Paramount, it was a 60% female viewing audience. And it's one of our hits. So as we transitioned into Paramount, it naturally came over. And that being said, um, it's very, you know, it's very much a niche audience that comes to a show like that. It's a tattoo competition show. Um, and, and with Paramount, what we're doing is we're, we're a premium scripted network that also does unscripted is sort of how I position it. And the unscripted that we do has to match the quality and the sensibility of the scripted stuff that we're doing. So in the transition, um, the first thing that, that you guys saw and these are all sort of my, you know, or the company's passion projects. Um, the Trayvon Martin story. These are, these are if, if I can just go into sort of the what we're looking for for you guys. There are two lanes that we play in. One are these documentaries. And the filter that we put those through are this, you know, the documentary series that we do. They only, they, they have to, even if they're a past tense story, they have to affect change in the present tense. It's sort of the the filter, right? The first one that we did was still on Spike. It was the Khalif Browder story. Uh, when we started that project, we specifically we had a goal, which was to shut down Rikers Island, which is really lofty and big. And, and But, you know, between episode five and six airing, Mayor de Blasio in New York announced that he was shutting down Rikers. We put a lot of pressure on him. With Trayvon Martin, we are specifically going after the Stand Your Ground laws, which you know started in Florida. Now they're, I think it's in 38 states, and it's essentially all of the gun issues that are happening in the U.S. are sort of based on this awful law. So uh, Trayvon's aired three episodes. This Monday, the fourth episode airs. We're hoping to have some effect on that law. Meanwhile, that's one lane that's sort of my passion. The people that know me know that that's my passion. The other lane is my TV history which is essentially selling formats around the world. And this is my first network like buyer job. Um, 
that is where Lip Sync Battle lives, where we just greenlit another season. It was announced yesterday, I think. Ink Master lives, Bar Rescue lives, and we're constantly looking for, you know, to, to, to quote one of my, the people that I look up to who's sitting right over there, Paul Telegdi, um, we're always looking for the next big thing. So if you guys are looking at, you know, you're, you're thinking about pitching the broadcasters, these big shiny floor formats, you should be thinking about Paramount Network as well. Well, picking up on that then, let's uh, go back to the others. So um, what are you specifically looking for, A, from, from the British producers here, or the specific gaps in your network now? What are you buying? I would say, and, and getting back to, you know, the forensic approach of American cable. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about our audience, and I always appreciate this, is they'll say, um, and history's audience is primarily male, but the reality is the, you know, any successful show, most successful shows are inherently dual. Once you swing too far in one direction or the other, uh, it, it doesn't tend to work. But what our audience will say is, well, I don't watch reality shows. And you know, for lack of a better word, um, I would call a lot of the shows that we do reality shows. They might be formats, they might be soaps, but they tell us that because they feel like they get information out of it, or they get history, or they get a little bit of engineering, or they get some takeaway, or skill. In many, in many cases. So they feel like they're getting something that's above and beyond um, what they perceive as strictly reality and which is what to them, I don't think of it as a dirty word, but to them a dirty word. So I'm looking for interesting, authentic characters, people that can guide me into a world um, with skill that have the ability for me and for us and our producers to infuse that with some history, some takeaway. And again, very specifically, not just men with beards. Do you know what I mean? It's one of the shows I'm most excited you about. You heard right it here. <laughs> well, one of the shows I'm most excited about is um, by two second generation Mexican American men who are fantastic. And they're former military, um, they do military restoration. Um, there are many different faces on American cable. And I think that, you know. You can't just follow the uh, what works in one given year and be too prescriptive about that. But uh, I think there's as a programmer, I'm not. You know, I think there's there's real tough tough competition in being able to find those characters. Yeah. I would have said for British buyers because there are many people and many American companies looking for for those kind of characters, and it's a bit needle in a haystack, really, it, isn't it's it? It's fair, and I think maybe British companies sometimes are at a disadvantage for casting just from a yeah. geographical perspective, but where they're not at a disadvantage at all is in those more skilled format areas, which we, yeah, so again, we've had tremendous, Truck Night in America is something that we did. We did, um, like I said, Fortune Fire, um, various things in that area. I've, I've had great conversations this week. That's a, and th those are idea first areas. They don't depend necessarily on, uh, on coming in with that character. And that's, and you know, there's great shows in, uh, in the UK, you know, Victorian Baker is an example of that, that are really actively getting into history in a, in a present tense way. Yeah, it'd be interesting to know, are there shows here that you wish you had or? Uh, Gina, what, what, what are you um, looking for? I mean, for? We're, we're on the hunt for, um, I, I always use the phrase, you know, reinvention of classic genres, and that's what uh, UK producers do brilliantly. Um, and so we're always looking right now at Lifetime, every permutation of relationship format. That is, we have a, we launched about six weeks ago, and it's already the highest rated driving growth for Lifetime night. Of, of the brand right now, we call it an always on real love Tuesday approach to content. Using Married at First Sight, we've just spun off two new franchises, Honeymoon Island and um, uh, Happily Ever After. And we're just using that to launch all sorts of big bold swings in the relationship genre. Um, I have a lot of serialized things, um, you know, probably not needing too many more social experiments. We do need self-contained formats. 
Um, so in relationships beyond romantic love, it could be, that's why I use super nanny, for example, parent child, um, tribes of women doing things together in a tight knit relationship, just inventive swings and plays in that arena. Um, you know, Wednesday night we're, build, we're building out, uh, I'm, I'm calling it just because it cuts through hot mess dramedy night, but it's, it's really the big talent, big character wheelhouse. So talent on display formats, you know, we, we've had a lot of success pioneering new ways of doing dance, rap, singing. Um, I'd like to expand it into female entrepreneurs. So and that can be format as well as doc soap. So I'm looking for ways to reinvent that to make it broader than just performance-based talent. And again, with that kind of middle-class aspirational sensibility, but seeing you know relatable situations outsized or putting relatable people through outsized social experiments and, on Tuesday night. So we're looking for that. We're also strategically looking for, um, we just opened up a Justice for Women Crime Night on Lifetime. So we're not, you know, the Tuesday and Wednesday are, are, are the future of Lifetime, but we're also looking at um, some mystery and, and crime formats, um, looking at something with Blast right now that we're doing some paid development on. And, and would that be like formatted Formatted, crime formatted, so, so that we can, can pilot them, air and them, then slip different and then volume into. follows. Yeah. So when we find a format that works, the reward is volume. Um, right, Joel. Well, and yeah. to contrast uh, Gina and Mike, we are not idea first, but definitely character first. Where our um, sort of broad overview is pop culture with a journalistic lens and target categories and genres that we're deciding to focus on. At this point, our true crime in the serialized sense, uh, music docs, and those can take uh, form and shape of a feature documentary or a documentary series. They're either artist driven or genre or era driven. Um, there's a couple of them that we're going to announce pretty soon that I'm very, very excited about. And it's all about access. It's those, oh, those characters. Are we talking like big names? Here? Really big names. I mean, we're, we're going after um, on the creative talent, the actors, A-listers, and same thing with, with artists. Um, we see that there is a an, uh, there's an audience and there's a nostalgia. If I can um, be so direct in in some of the projects that we're going after right now in the music space, um, and we found a lot of success. I mean, there's a lot of brilliant, brilliant stories to tell right now. Um, you know, we even looked at a project like Woodstock that, that is the Ken Burns PBS project. So in terms of elevated, entertaining um, uh, characters and access, that's what we're chasing after. Political thriller is a space that we want to get into. Um, I have a real, real need for true crime right now in the serialized space. Um, if I can be even more specific, like a single um, a single villain who's, uh, who is being chased and caught. Like we want those retrospective stories and everything that Wait Netflix minute, is mate, doing. Let's go back. <laughs> so you've got a real need, there's a real yes, need here. Yes, real need as in pitch me, but I'm not gonna give you my email address. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna come to that. Um, what, for a current crime? As it could in, be a, a, a really loud crime. story that you might know about. Historical is fine. Oh. There's, there's a nuance between the um, active investigation format and the retrospective, we know how the story ends, but there's a new layer, a new um, individual, a new archive, a new access. I mean, you look at things like Wild Wild Country or Evil Genius or The Staircase. Those are all individual um, true crime dramas that would necessarily Or the Trayvon work. Martin Project. Or Trayvon. <laughs> <laughs> Everything that Chachi is doing, we would do, no. Um, it, it's, it's elevated into the sense that with Evil Genius, you had a, a journalist, a, a filmmaker, who embedded himself with this female villain for years to get the story. That's what I talk about when I say reality is a format that you build from the foundation up. We want to go back. We want to be current. But at the same time, we want that history. We want that archive. We want that access that only comes, generally speaking, from filmmakers. Brilliant. Right, let's talk about how people actually get to you then. What's the process? <laughs> the pitch, the, again, you know, from my experience when I first got to America, 
the pitch, whatever people say, is a more formal process than I think than the British uh, system, which everyone here will know, starts with 20 minutes of chat and gossip, <laughs> and <laughs> and, uh, and then you would pitch. Uh, typically in, uh, in in the UK, you would take in a raft of ideas because you don't know where they're going to go. I mean, yeah, agents say only take in one, which I never do because if. If it's just one and you hate it, you've really got a short meeting. So, don't, but never take in more than two ideas. I mean, what's so? Can I? I'm just going to cut that. you off. Yeah, tell okay. me. So, again, I mentioned I've I sold shows for 20 years and made them. Right, that was sort of everything I did. The now that I'm a buyer, I used to be guilty of going with five ideas. That was sort of because it was a numbers game. Going with five ideas. If they like one, maybe get a development deal. You know. I only buy from people who come in with one idea that when they pitch it, it's as if the show is going to happen even if I don't buy it. I need to see the passion behind the idea. That's it. I, I, it, um, I tell agents, please don't have your people come in. It's different at a festival like this, I will say, because I'm just meeting people and the agents set up these meetings and you, know, you have the people who have been pitching me here have no idea what I'm looking for, but I'm talking about the regular people that I know for years, they come in, they all know now to just come in with the one thing. I, it's almost like I want them to fool me into believing that they're only going to work on that project, even though but I the know they're going to their lives. Yeah. <laughs> so, I need them to lie to me and yeah. pull it off. I, I, would, I, would that, I mean, that is genuinely interesting because <laughs> I always take two just in case one goes so badly that there's something else. No, you know I what, I, I, I turn it around. Like if you come in with something and you go like balls to the wall, you, go, create, you show me your passion and, I, and it's just not for me, I always pass in the room, right? And then I'll ask you what you're excited about that you might not have thought is right for the network. Because generally that conversation leads to a more interesting conversation yeah. than just sort of the pitch that was supposed to happen. I would tend to agree with that. And I, I would say um, in, <laughs> having filmmakers, producers, talent come into a room and pitch something when there is such an extensive deck, such extensive work on whether it's a mood reel or a sizzle or a presentation, that the producers have actually gone that extra step to not say, I want a development deal coming out of this meeting, but I've done that development and this is that perfect project and it's either right for you or not. That's what I appreciate. I also was a producer for 11 years before becoming an exec, and sometimes you would want to keep your idea malleable so the buyer has some sort of input. We're the opposite at Epics, where you come in with your idea. We are a place where filmmakers and producers and talent are going to flourish, and we just give you the guardrails to say, go and make the show that you want. We don't want to have to inject our own creative ideas because ultimately film executives don't make the hits that producers do. So we want you to make the show the way you want to make it. And either it works for us or it doesn't. I don't want a producer walking in the room and saying, well, it could go this way, it could go that way. You know, put, put your, inject your opinion into it. That, that's not going to work for us. Well, I mean, I'll come to you two guys, but that that is then people need to come to you with really mm. having done a lot of work with a tape, with a deck, and you know, with with that passion. Mm -hmm. Don't say you don't we need a tape because it's not true. You need a tape. I disagree with okay, you. Okay, I'm then. going to disagree. Go on. I would say the, my my <laughs> one my one ask. I would say that we're pretty we're accessible. We're not loose. I think we're not using that term. I think we're, yeah. we're fairly open to to, to pitches. Yeah. It's fairly you know. Uh, fairly easy to get to us. I haven't seen Gina in five years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you have. Yeah, but we're um, Facebook friends. Yeah. <laughs> but I used to work with Chachi. I used to work with Chachi. Um, yeah. I would say my one ask is that just, just know a little bit about, and that's where agents are, um, have done a very quick study, and I've been back for about five and a half months, yeah. and realized putting the message out, I'm like, yeah. oh, you have a very good agent because they're, they're reciting these terms that, we, that we've been using. Yeah. Just, know, just know what we're looking for, what has worked on the brand. Um, be, be aware of the range of, of content that we're looking for. You know, I, I don't like the marathon pitches, personally. 
differently, but I'm open to whatever you have on your slate that you think is relevant for lifetime. But you're saying you would you bought off paper? I buy off paper all the time. I, I respond most to titles and concepts. Unless you're, at, even if it's a doc soap, uh, we, were, we were talking with Seven Wonder yesterday and they just described a world after listening to me very attentively and just like that, she described a world. Well, I'm, now I would like more, you know, please, if you have them on tape, if you have a blurb, you know, a one pager, yeah. send it to me and we can start to work and maybe I can give you a little bit of development money. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's a specific dance troupe, for example, then yes, you, you, you know, I, yeah. you have tape to bring it to life. But I, <laughs> you I often like know by just... No, I don't believe it. By the title yeah. and by the concept. And it's good to have the comp with this blast thing, I'm not yeah. going to name it, but you know, they were well versed in the Tuesday night, Wednesday night strand, and I just happened to mention that Justice for Women was taking off for us, and never thought of it, and they just mentioned a title. Sent me, sent me the content to back it up, and they have a development deal with us. I mean, I would definitely agree with the idea of just fewer, better things. I mean, yeah. in the sense that, and that's a risky thing for a producer, you have to acknowledge that. If they're gonna put that amount of um, thought into something, um, and it might turn into a no. That's a that's a that's a risky uh, endeavor. But at the same time, um, it, I used to say it's okay to send me a bunch of little blurbs, and, mm -hmm. and, and I, I just feel like that's the easy thing to say. But at the same time, that's not serving it's the guy who's true. pitching. It's not true <laughs> because it's going to get lost yeah. in the shuffle. And I'll tell you a, another thing. And everybody has a different process, but a lot of stuff I've been working on lately has been conversation based. Yep. It's yeah. somebody comes in, they might be pitching something to Chachi's point. Maybe it's a no, um, but you sort of try to get to know who you're talking to in terms of the producers and what they do and what they do well. And you might start a conversation that the, then becomes a pitch or turns into something. Mm -hmm. I met this guy. Sometimes named, not even a this formulated guy Roy, pitch. This director Roy, right over there. He's sitting over he's there. I see him. He's on his phone. phone. Yeah, he's on his phone. <laughs> hey, Roy. Roy, so, you're wrong. So, you're wrong. No, Roy. So yesterday, two, <laughs> day, two days ago, he, he came in, or to the hotel room, which is weird. He, we, he, he <laughs> <laughs> unannounced. And, but, yeah. So he <laughs> pitched me something, <laughs> right? Then I was like, yeah. Then we just started having a conversation, okay? And the conversation led to him talking about something else that he wasn't going to talk about. Uh. And I leave this conference knowing that I'm gonna do everything I possibly can to make that happen, right? Like I've said it to him last night at dinner, and that, had we not just continued a conversation which started about my hats and your style and then jokes and stuff, that when it's something else, you know. But then, and, and, but then the next stage, obviously, for you guys, there has to then be a tape because there is the whole upselling that you guys so, do, have to then do. Not necessarily. It helps. Depends. It helps. It really depends. It's, we easier, usually to, it's easier to go straight yeah. to series. If, I, if I'm being a thousand percent honest right now, specifically with the case of Roy, yeah. he's sending me a tape that he already has. And I said, I might not show this to my bosses because let me watch it first. Uh. I, it, <laughs> uh, no, I just, it, it, in the end, depending upon the show, I, you can read sort of the people that you work with and you kind of know what they respond to. So some shows I sell through just through paper and talk, even if there is a tape. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the tape hurts, right? Because sometimes when you submit a tape, it's very hard for people to break away from that tape. They watch that tape, they think that that tape is actually the show. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, when it's just a tape, it's still development. But we've, we've I don't need a tape to get to development, but I think a development often involves a tape. Yeah. yeah. Obviously. But, you know, once you start in on paid development, that could be, you know, extensive paper, that could be casting, that could be a proof of concept tape. It could also could be, any, a, be a any whole number heap of hell. It can be a whole heap of hell, but it's also incumbent. This is why I say fewer better things sometimes can be everybody's friend. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like sometimes when you have a development pipeline with hundreds of things in it, you feel like, wow, that's great. I have 100 things in my development pipeline. That's not always good news for a network. It's not always good news for a producer. So, uh, you know, I, I, what we've tried to do is endeavor to 
something's in development, keep it for, at the front and center. You know, have a weekly call with the producer, see how they're doing so that you're constantly getting new information and new fun things from them mm -hmm. so that it doesn't become this thing that gets triggered. You do a pilot, it disappears for eight months, and then suddenly it comes back and becomes harder to interest well, people. Well, but, but one of the things that I f found, you know, having worked there and a bit wiser now, you can get really excited. You've got all these things in development and and it takes a lot of time and effort and there's never enough money to make the tape that they really want you to make. And right. it, it can end up being an extraordinarily frustrating experience. That's why uh, Epix's approach is less development, more series, because it's only gonna help the creators coming in the door where you're not gonna drive them through this six, this nine, this year long development process. If there is specificity in voice and tone, which a tape can communicate so much better than pages, then that work is already done. It's already done for you. And it's easier for us to go to series. I feel that frustration though, because I, development is not an end. It's just a means. Yeah, and yeah. too often it's like, wow, we're gonna do a $25,000 development or this or that. And every producer will overspend on their development in a good way. They will put their own funds into that yeah. um, and deliver the best tape that they possibly can. So it really has to be a means to an end. Yeah, but you know, it, it can be hell. We all acknowledge that. <laughs> but I'd say with the, with the promise of heaven on the end of it, Talka, and I can, I can. Am I sounding bitter? I'm not meaning <laughs> no, to. No, no. I just want. I, you sound you know, a little bitter. But making a decision <laughs> should, should be a serious I, it's process. Just the reality. It's when you first go to America and you have all these meetings with you lovely people and everyone's really nice. Nobody says what they really mean in the room, and you go and you go. I'm brilliant, this is amazing, everybody loves me. And then the agents ring and say, no, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> That's, no. Isn't that normally how it I, goes? I tell people well, what I mean. Yeah, yeah no, no, it's very, the, the point is, it's a very, very competitive environment. Yes. As all producers know, there's millions of producers out there mm. pitching, it's very, very. With all the same ideas, by the way, yeah. which is the, what must make it frustrating yeah. for producers. And if the development process is done right, for us, it's a one to four ratio, and we, by and large, honor that. So we, you know, okay. for four paid development, one goes to series. That's that's our model, and I can I can say with honesty because it's true. You know, some of our biggest series have come out of twenty-five thousand dollar, fifty thousand dollar, you know, seventy-five thousand dollar development steps. And you know, we we all know it's it can be torturous. But uh, if you're working with great partners, you know, I like to think that A&E Networks are great creative partners to work with and very collaborative. Um, you know, it. It, the reward, we're, we're very loyal, the reward is volume. Um, how about um, uh, the whole packaging process, the need for a British producer to have agents? Obviously a lot of the bigger British producers do, but the smaller producers who want to have access to you guys might not have an agent. Does that matter? How important is that? Can they get to you without an agent? They can get to me without an agent. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I've, I've worked with many UK producers mm -hmm. over, the, over the course of my career, I, and uh, I prefer just the direct contact. And when it comes to editorial, right. and in particular, um, I actually prefer to keep a British, if, if an idea originates with a British producer, I, I can't recall a time where I have then made an American company execute it. I prefer, if I believe enough in the concept and in you, then you should be producing it. But that does happen really quite often, and I, I'm sure there's people in this room who have sold ideas and then been partnered with an American company, and then they sort they lose control of the idea and it doesn't the, go well. The way I do it generally would, if there was going to be a partnership, I would let them sort out who they want to partner with in the States. I, I don't, I, I, I would never take a creative from London or anywhere, and if I'm buying their idea, force them to work with someone that never, that, that never works, by the way. Yeah. It always, I mean, it, 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 it is, uh, I was talking to producers uh, recently who suffered badly from that mm -hmm. because the idea does not get translated in no. the correct way. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but there, a, a lot of channels do that. A lot of people do it. You've mm -hmm. got your trusted people at home. It might be somebody new you don't know. You've got to partner with somebody you do. We, we don't do that at and we don't do that at Lifetime. Mm. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I mean, it might be showrunners or, you know, an American you, policy you editor somewhere. or something like that. But between RDF, BBC, Blast, Zodiac, I can list many, many more. They've been the ones to execute. And then what about that model of uh, being able to edit over here, even if the stuff may have been shot mm -hmm. in America? It's, it's a wow. conversation on all, on every individual project for, for us. I think it's definitely a conversation. And, we, we, you know, I've encouraged partnerships. I've at times insisted on them. But I've also taken chances on very small companies. And every once in a while, you take a chance on a very small company that turns up something massive. Yeah. And listen, small companies, will, they will overperform. You know, they will put their grid into something. And they're often very open to you know, uh, suggestions on who a showrunner can mm -hmm. be. Um, and I just came out of a very good, I mean, the, well, I'm in the process of a very good experience with that, with a, with a small company. But it's case by case, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, let's talk about money, deals. Oh, uh, I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, uh, I think, uh, the, the money is better, generally. The budgets are bigger. Um, but, it, but they just don't go as far. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if anybody's prepared to tell us what their budget ranges are or where, what their tariffs are or what kind of depends, kind of... It depends on the show. I mean, really, yeah. that's... There's, it, if the show needs the money, we would find the money. Even if I, if I gave you an arbitrary number of we don't spend more than this, yeah. but then a show that we really want to make and collectively we realize it's going to cost more than that, we'll find the money. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's bespoke for us too. It's whatever the series dictates, we're going to pay for it. And right now, Epix is the underdog. Nobody knows about us. Um, we want to be competitive, so we're going to pay a dollar more to get that project. That's sort of our... Line. Just a dollar? Just a dollar. <laughs> no, 99 cents. That's a great strategy. <laughs> Very Price is Right. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> we do different deals for different things. I mean, History did an American version of, uh, and it's obviously a very different model, but an American version of Top Gear that was very successful and that obviously came in as this gigantically epic format. And, you know, we did our piece of it. We did a um, uh, version of Harry Bikers a few years ago. You know, primarily what we're going to do is we're going to look for that full ownership, full commission model. The one thing I would say is that we're, I think, you know, our deals are very good. I think that we're good with back end. I think we actually send back end checks. And I hear producers say, listen, it's, it's <laughs> you know, um, some of the deals where you have to sort of recoup every little bit of money before right. they get anything are rough. Um, and I think we're a little bit more favorable in that way. But um, but you, you partially hit on it. it it's, it's, you know, in the UK, you might, you have more rights to your material, but maybe at times aren't getting the upfront budget that you want or need, and that money is maybe going to come downstream or not. But I mean, I think we're pretty competitive on that upfront money. But and there's a range of things that we'll pay. There's no specific. But nobody's going to get the rights with any of you guys. No, with us, we're, we're, we're different. Um, Epix is a US only premium uh, network at this point. So what that means is producers and filmmakers coming in the door can retain the world, honestly. Like, that's what sets us apart right now. Um, we're open to CoPro, we're open to CoFi. One of my projects right now is a trilogy with the US, uh, UK, and Canada. And we'll see how that works. Epix is the only creative voice, but we are willing to give the world. We have the power of the MGM international engine. If you want to um, leverage that, we, we can certainly activate it, but we, we're, we're US only at this point, so. Gauchi, yes. Oh no, I was just thinking about the future of Epix. I mean, right now that's, I'm like, <laughs> and MGM, what is the future of Epix? MGM eventually, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, with, uh, you, 
Historically, Viacom wants to own everything, like any networks. It, it, you know, it's part of the business model. But we've done deals where they were straight licenses. I mean, especially when we're in the format game. Mm. So uh, there's, you know, I I'm always very sympathetic towards the producers because it was my whole career. So and I've gotten screwed over by networks in the past, and I've done really good deals with the networks in the past. So I always have one foot on the producer side. <laughs> Yeah, listen, I think that networks often are going to push for full ownership. That's just the way it is. Yeah. That's, yeah. The, that's the business of it. But there is real value in uh, having a success with an American network having that's very channels. well so known. History Channel is. And yeah. <laughs> hundreds. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? We've done, I, I developed a, with a, a company called Prometheus a, a special, a special called Ancient Aliens. Uh, 12 oh. years ago, it was a yeah. special to, to, to wow. even predict that that would have hundreds of episodes and its own conference now is hard to believe, but the value of, of that to a production company uh, mm. is, is infinite and the scale is there in success. And, and I would say we're, we are competitive, but healthy and fair in terms of overall budgets. When it comes to the ownership and the rights issues, um, you know, obviously we we do prefer, and our model is to own most of yes. you know most commis commissions certainly. Um, but everything is a conversation, and it might get repetitive for me to reference Married at First Sight again, mm. but that was a little Danish format, mm. and we wanted it, we went after it, and you know, and we negotiated this pre-existing format. So you would imagine that, it, you know, it's nice for, 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 for mm. the producers that originated that. Um, whenever I come up with the spin-off or the team comes up with a spin-off, then that's a different deal, you know, with Kinetic, the Ailey producer. are pretty ferocious in there. I think, <laughs> I, I think, <laughs> my experience. No, I, I, I think we're fair. And, you know, Kinetic was the producer of, of all of these, but through this partnership, then when the production company and the network come up with other shows like <coughs> Seven Year Switch and Bright, then it starts to, to pay off for all of us. That's yet a third yeah. production model, but I'm just, I'm giving an example of, you know, as good partners with us and, you know, Kinetic retains certain rights on some of them. And then on the ones that we originate together and A&E owns the format, then, then we, you know, but it's a, it's a nice partnership that benefits both parties. So uh, we're coming towards the end. There's a couple of questions that I'll take. I mean, the uh, headline seems to be you guys are all open for business to British mm -hmm. producers. Um, how do we reach these guys, please, is the, <laughs> is the question. So how do people reach you? How do people get... Uh, do they email you? They email. I mean, mm -hmm. Rachel's all... not giving out. Info her at epics.com. <laughs> yeah. Everyone knows her name. I'm going to say it's Rachel Brill, and then you can figure out the rest. Most of us have emails <laughs> with companies that we work for. Um, I usually bring uh, some of my execs' cards with me to these, and I just give them out to them. Oh, that's, so, nice. that's But I don't have any this time. So people can email you direct? Yeah. Yeah. And. Absolutely. and I what, respond they to everybody. E they email you direct with a log line? Or no, or? they shouldn't email me a pitch directly. They should email me to set up a pitch because there's a whole, there is a process of us having to send out, you know, there's a lot of people who believe that their idea is wholeheartedly the most unique and original idea in the world and that we've never heard it before. So they send you an email mm -hmm. and then, you know, I've heard the same yeah. pitch maybe a thousand times, but then maybe we were already in development on it. And then all of a sudden you're getting sued because they think you stole their idea. Yeah. So it's actually, it's, it's mutually beneficial for uh, you guys to sign this document that we send out. Yeah. And just say, send an email and say hello. Yeah. It's nice hearing you. I would love to know more about Epics. I, let me see if there's anything I have that, that may align with you. Mm -hmm. Start with a hello. <laughs> Get direct emails or <laughs> not five so ideas in the first no, email. Email. And, and and please don't send um, pitches on LinkedIn. I get that um, all what? the time. Um, all the time. On LinkedIn. On LinkedIn. On oh. LinkedIn, yes. Yeah. I was just checking out Epics and I think that my idea is perfect. Here's the sizzle, here's the log line, here's the deck, and I'm like, on no. <laughs> yeah, on LinkedIn. So please don't do that. Um and um uh uh, one final question, how are you all going to fight back 
against Netflix and all the streaming uh, audiences, we, we, we um, channels, we all know that it's a very competitive world now. Are you worried? <laughs> Consistently great ideas that will, that's yeah. delivering the best content in our voice, being true to our voice. You know, I don't, I don't Those even think about blokes, it. Those they're always there. No, I mean, I, I <laughs> there's always, there's always a, an industry disrupting another industry and this view that you know that the previous model is somehow going to get utterly left behind and that's often and usually not the case and I, I you know there are people that get paid a lot more than me to think about that a lot more than I do but I, I, I do I have a creative job and my job is to meet folks like you and have conversations and talk about the best show that we can make and I think that part of it is just trying to be fresh each time. Again, not being so laser focused on the one face that you think the network needs or the one approach. Mm -hmm. Like I we bought a show a few months ago that started with a, um, a piece that Paul Harvey had done on his show 20, 30 years ago about, it was called God, uh, God Created a Farmer. And it just was just an odd beginning for a tape. And it was so different, you know, and so great and so fresh. And I would say that's kind of where it has to be. It's got to be about the ideas and it's got to be about trying something a little bit different. Even if you're aiming for an audience that, uh, and there's certain attributes to it that, that are similar to shows that you've had that have worked, but it's, it's just doing fresh things and not worrying about that. Yeah. It's not that it's not a worry, but it's not necessarily <laughs> our worry, in my view. Great. They're, yeah, they're in the volume business. Epics is not in the volume business. We're carefully curating every single series and giving it the support it needs, giving our series the billboards, giving them the marketing campaigns. And you just can't do that on scale. So that's not our approach. Without completely vilifying and destroying Netflix, um, what's been happening over the last couple of years because this industry is also an ego-driven industry, is lots of, I, get, I often get calls about projects that Netflix is interested in buying and the producers are begging me to buy it so they don't have to work at Netflix. And the reason is because when you, if, because they're a volume business, mm -hmm. people like to see their stuff. They like a marketing plan behind their projects and traditional cable networks still do that. Whereas Netflix, you're one of a thousand. And if you're lucky... You get on Carousel. Yeah, yeah you get on Carousel. <laughs> if you like this, you might like this. Yeah. So there's a lot. And, you know, granted, they have all the money in the world and they pay more than most. Mm -hmm. So that is usually the driver for producers. They go there because they get straight to series offer. They do that a couple of times and then they come back. Okay, great. Okay, well, we're out of time. Thanks, Gina, Mike, Rachel, Charchi. Uh, as Trump might say, the opportunities are huge. <laughs> 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 then the next step is down to you guys. Good luck, everybody. And get hold of them. Thank so you. Good. Thank you.